say my approach is much less antagonistic because I believe in re reading across the lines and, and I believe in dialoguing across the lines, but as you all know from my accent and from speaking to me, I am American. So my perspective on, on the question or the questions that we're talking about will be coming from that side. I'm going to start off, but I'm going to be followed by Jeff here is going to talk in various ways about sonnet or formal issues, and then we're going to get some alchemy from Richard. Um, why, when this panel idea was thought of with, with David, why did I choose these guys? Um, I chose them because they're both um, British, to help out with my like lack of cultural understanding. They're two voices um, I, yeah. well, I mean, I think it's important that, you know, we can have, we can, you know, that makes me think of this and, you know, we are coming with, from, to you with different, you know, baggage. Um, but also, they're two authors I admire in, in a variety of ways and for a variety of reasons, but who also formally, and, and for me, at the heart of some of the aesthetic debates, um, is the question of form, the question of reception, and the question of, you know, how we are, as writers perhaps, thinking or not thinking about that. And then when we come to a question like this, where we're chatting with you or reading to you things we've prepared, reflecting on this, it, it's also a question of how do we ourselves um, think of this question, perhaps outside and around our own practices as authors. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Richard's work, um, the book in particular that I have been working hard to get through, which I think is fabulous. It's called The Dwelling. Um, dwelling. He, There's no article. Just Dwelling. I, just dwelling. Get, I give you the article every time. Mm. Sorry. Dwelling, which is even prettier. Um, it's an extremely fabulous, dense, demanding book. So the question of, of what an audience is willing to enter into. Mm. The language is, is very worked, and mm. though it is prose and it is solidly there on the page, it is also in so many ways, on so many levels, poetic, poetry, um, image, and it reminds me in many ways, for those of you who are fans of the movie Blow Up, the first time I heard him read, at least I thought of that, um, where one is always trying to get at something one is not sure of what one perceives, <coughs> and that's very exciting. Um, Jeff's work um, as a poet, primarily poet, um, very diverse, um, oftentimes musicality is at the center of the work that's been very exciting to me, um, various ways that well, the voice can be paced, the voice can be lined on the page and also performed off the page. And so um, I, I thought that that would make a fun trio for you, I hope. Um, the basis for this is also that I've been writing these columns for um, Tears in the Fence for, this is uh, the 11th one just came out. Um, some of them address specific questions such as what is experiment, and I, I brought in issue number 56 to sort of start out with this. Um, and the most recent one is also talking about what, what are the limits of language? Have we hit a limit in language in, as we look at um, formal exploration and, and, and what words can do or are doing in the sense of how one is defining what is a poem? Um, and in that text, I talk about um, three different authors in particular, and Mary Albiak, very much an on-the-page poet. Um, then I talk about Vanessa Place, who did this book, book called Poetry pa Plays, which is a vial of dirt, you know, a new nature poem, or the pure nature poem, however you want to see it, um, a kind of um, poetry version of Marcel Duchamp in a way, um, saying, you know, is this a work of art, is this not a work of art, is this a book, is this not a work of book, a book. Um, and she's very conscious that she is coming out in a lot of ways from the conceptual art movement and the artistic sphere. Um, she writes also other things that are quite textual, but I, I spoke about that particular work of art. And I spoke about um, a, a series called Concrete by Andrew Topol, which are concrete poems that then he photographed in a space, but where he talks about what is a poem, and for him the poem was the personal experience, um, not the actual product. So the, po the thing produced, which could be, you know, so redefining the idea of what the poem is and where the poem is located. And at that point, of course, then the poem is only his own private experience, so what we experience is something different. Um, so, so just to reflect on those, I will tell you, for me, of tradition and experience, for me relates to inheritance, tradition, and then inventiveness, experiment. Um, how, as authors, readers, publishers, do we engage with the past, and do we make the future? Whatever aesthetic realm in our writing and our reading we are involved in. Um, personally, 
this began for me with my own, you know, youthful um, introduction to poetry, which is that I was a student of Joseph Brodsky's for three years, who, you know, said, we've written too much free verse, we must write in form. So, you know, like a good student, wrote in form, you know, and I wrote in strict form and that's what I did because that's what I was told to do and, you know, I wanted this person I admired <laughs> in lots of ways to think I was doing the right thing. Um, but of course, without realizing it, I had started to play with those forms and undo things. So as I was sending them to very traditional magazines and getting rejected right and left, you know, with <laughs> notes such as, well, when you write a real sonnet, <laughs> or, you know. <laughs> um, so I thought, hmm, I didn't understand this. And then I came across a book called Moving Borders. Um, which is innovative writing by women, and I'm reading this fabulous anthology from Talisman Press, which I think really needs to be reprinted. It's called Moving Borders. It's a wonderful collection of poems, but also essays and writings by these authors. And as I was reading it, I thought, oh, if this is experimental writing, then maybe I've somehow slipped off of that like traditional lyric poet bandwagon without knowing it. Um, and and I then read addressed where I was sending my poems and things started to be taken. I thought, hmm. And it, it was funny because as I gave my first readings, people came to me and said, oh, you, you must have known right away you were an experimental poet. I thought, still working on accepting that, <laughs> you know? And I do think in lots of ways, both my reading but my writing bridge those areas. And I think that's true for a lot of writers today. They have, you know, they're working within and without the traditions. They're inheriting and looking for new ways to, to explore whatever is happening for them in language, given all of the possibilities from the past. Um, for this year, I think it's also an interesting time to be having Tears in the Fence, because it's 2014, right? 100 years, everybody's really obsessed right now. 100 years ago, we have World War I. And I think World War I is an interesting point of change in relationship to this question, because Apollinaire, you know, as we all know, goes off to war and gets himself you know, injured in the head and eventually will, the last, um, pass away from that. But Apollinaire, at this point in time, talks about a need to move away from the symbolism that dominated that period of time and to move towards clarity. Believe it or not, Apollinaire said, let's move to clarity, simplicity, a sort of directness. Um, and we see a, a kind of parallel move with, you know, the interest in imagism, the image and, and, you know, the interest that starts to happen in some of the English and American poets with a language. And I thought about this as people read last night and today. The, I, I missed some of last night. I'm really sorry about that. But the, the conversational nature of some of the work or the way it's presented or read and that that really, you know, became so much more the, the wave in through a, a lot of the 20th century. Um, to portray what I think has happened, which is, you know, a, a turn to natural language as opposed to ornate or obtuse or abstract. Um, of course, we know that parallels, of course, the reverse move, the cut-ups, the, the, the dadaist, the, you know, we have all of this going on at once. So what, where do we are, how do we get to now? And for America, I will generalize away um, with all the flaws that happen when one does that. Um, as far as the experimental side of things goes, or what gets classified as the uh, you know the nonconformist, oh we're you know we're way out there, whether it, that's true or not true, it seems to be broken up since 9/11, especially. I mean, in in the U.S., there was a lot of the mid-century language poetry, the postmodernist, and the cut-up, um, the inheritance of France and you know, what the French surrealists would bring into the American poetics. Um, and thus the work became, you know, obtuse, challenging in various ways. Post 9-11, what has happened is there's been a lot of debates within, you know, the, those same communities of aesthetically, you know, challenging practices where a lot of those authors have said, wait, we, we must return to a way to communicate. And this word communication has come up. And and for those, for some of those people, that's, that's meant a return to what I call one of the groups that I call one direction of experimental writing in the States, which is politically engaged writing. And people that led that are, you know, the, the Chain issue. Chain was a magazine that ran on themes. And the first issue that, that on the theme of political writing from Juliana Spar and Jenna Osman. And Juliana Spar has gone very much deeply into reflecting on how can work be aesthetically challenging and politically engaged at the same time. We've seen other groups like the Press Belladonna Press and thus Rachel Levitsky also calling for the same kind of thing. And there's been a large, large movement for that. A second direction, of course, in America, which you probably are somewhat familiar with, um, if not very, is a sort of American surrealism that we never really kind of get over. Um, James Tate, 
Russell Edson are two big names in there, but of course that all comes out of John Ashbery in many, many ways. Um, and, and in the younger generation, we're seeing it continued because of the university system. So we're seeing the students of these people who are taking what they've done and, and continuing those practices or looking for new ways to, to develop on those practices, but still maintaining again that, that tradition. And those, some of those young people that I've mentioned in some of the articles in Tears, for the, Tears in the Fence are people such as um, Matthew Rohrer, um, but one might even argue that authors such as Harriet Mullen fall into, in sort of tangential ways, that category. Um, a third group that I also talked about in, and I'm going to read you a teeny bit from issue number 56. Uh, no, yes, issue number 56. A third group of experimental poetics in the U.S. would be the whole fascination and obsession and large debates here, and this is where the divide comes up in the big get out the punching, you know, bags. Um, conceptual literature. What is it? Who goes in there? And, you know, and, you know, etc. And Marjorie Perloff wrote this, these articles saying, conceptual literature is the new avant-garde. Well, then she talks about, you know, John Cage and Susan Howe, and I thought, well, how can they be the new avant-garde when they're like the old avant-garde? Um, so, so that's my article in issue 56 was sort of saying, Maybe there is a new avant-garde on the rise somewhere out there, um, though conceptual right, literature can't be it in the sense that it's been around. But it's great that that's being acknowledged and talked about and sort of categorized. And so that brings me to issue number 60, where I'm sort of saying, well, maybe there's a fourth category, a problematic category, a threatening category for us, um, or perhaps not a threatening category, but perhaps an echo to last century as well, where the arts... Um, in various ways interacted with language. Well, we saw that in all the futurism, Dadaism movement. But right now there's a large intermedia or intermedial um, collaborative, we can look at it. Um, a lot of work being done in those areas, art and poetry, art and science, we talked about it earlier. But we see that going very, very far away from what we can read on the page when we think, see things such as the SMEC writing, um, or some of the visual poetics and where they're going now, where I think, well, what's the difference uh, between some of these visual poetic works and abstract expressionist paintings of the mid, you know, 19, you know, <coughs> mid 20th century, where uh, those questions are raised for me. I do think they're also in the, the traditionalist, you know, there are sort of spheres one can generalize about as well. In America, we've had, you know, we have the, the new formalist, you know, we're going to go back to form and we're going to rework with form. Um, and one can even categorize within that, bizarrely, one might say, does new formalism include a group like Ulipo, or do we give them over to the experimentalists? But they are working with constraints. Um, and then in America, there's you know the post-confessionalist question and the question of narrative, narrative and poem and line break. And so those are you know a lot of the schools. So my th idea is to give you a couple of the questions I asked in here and then let these guys talk. Um, and I'm not going to read this in order. I'm going to give you things out of order. So some of the questions I asked near the end of the article um, that I wrote for what's avant-garde in the 21st century um, was, can one set out to be <coughs> avant-garde? Can you intentionally set out to be avant-garde? I'm going to be new and different and whatever. Can one seek the radical, the new, without forcing it, and thus revealing in the felt effort of that an inability to break free from the reign of the past? Is being avant-garde a breaking free from the past, or a new incorporation of it, a taking the past along to bring it into a new kind of light? And I said, certainly for most authors, one might admire for their avant-garde breakthroughs some sort of breakthrough in history, be that the troubadours, the symbolists, the modernists, the objectivists, the surrealists, the dialogists, New York school poets, beats, language poets, or recent conceptual writers. So question of intentionality is there on some level, or consciousness of what one's doing, which going backwards, my article, brings out the question of the new. And when we look at, I mean, you read all this, the new, new, all the <coughs> things that are thought, I live in France, so I can't help, you know, Baudrillard and Lyotard and Jameson, you know, thinking about postmodernism and Baudrillard in particular, the idea that there's so much new that we can't find the, the original, you know, we've, we've, we've gotten to the nightmarish space for the Walter Benjamin um, essay, you know, art in the age of mechanical reproduction, where suddenly perhaps that original has been reproduced so much we can't find the original, where is it gone? Um, so in here I say instead of a hundred years or 50 or 10 or even a year or so, the turnover in what is new in art feels like a flash mob gathering. 
They're there, then they have melded back into the mass, into a future past. A neon bulb lures authors, artists, musicians, performers like dogs on leashes from one new thing to another. We have been living in a time saturated by an, quote, unquenchable thirst for the new, which David Lehman argues, and that was in the 90s he wrote this book about New York School, he's talking about the avant-garde, argues began during the epoch of Warhol. Reading the manifestos of the past 150 years, and I've done that a few times, and it's really funny, um, because they're so like, we're, we're the total poetry. This is the total poetry. I mean, every single time. Um, I feel like everyone has been yelling Pound's make it new slogan, and with each new has followed the conviction of attaining a total art, the all-encompassing art, even if, as Alan Badiou stated, there is necessarily a plurality of arts, and however we may imagine the ways in which the arts might inter intersect, there is no imaginable way of totalizing this plurality. But, and he actually argues that you know, the new new would actually be to refuse to make art. <laughs> then we like, we've made no art, there it is. Yeah. Whew, it's yeah. avant-garde. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is kind of painful. <laughs> That's old as well, but yeah. anyway. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But there we go, it's so yeah. old already, yeah. we already know. <laughs> <laughs> it's no longer new. Um, but in recent decades, the new new has taken on an H&M feel where we need enough clothing trends trending on each floor to accommodate any level of trendsetter and what shoppers can return, where shoppers can return every few weeks to encounter new, new trends. We live in the new country of the post postmodernism, new lyric postmodernism, the hybrid post post genre is dead. It is alive, write about the self. No, don't do that. Get into flarf, go beyond the conceptual because everyone is a poet. No, no one is a true poet. There is no truth. Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, see me blog. Face Facebook, instant satisfaction, everything I have ever seen before is so passe epic. <laughs> so that's what I had to say about the new. And I will just end with by saying the, the, the article began with the question of what is experimental? And I said, you know, I started with a personal anecdote saying experimental literature is whatever is just beyond the bounds of your own personal reading comfort zone. I say in answer to the too often posed question, what is experimental writing? I go back to the 15th century definition of experimental in, in this little essay, but really what I'm saying for someone who's experimental, perhaps a completely formalist poem written in the 20th century is experimental. Um, and this is the problem with terminology and boxes and divides. Um, and so that's just to whet the appetite and we'll hear some, some other thoughts. <laughs> Okay, so I, I want to uh, just explore um, some, of the, some of the issues that Jen has um, raised through thinking about a particular form, um, the, the sonnet. Um, this might seem a little bit polemic, polemical, uh, but it, it's obviously because of that, it's not without um, a good dose of hyperbole. Um, and perhaps what I have to say is even irrelevant now. Um, it's already old. It's already old, exactly. <laughs> um, as some of you uh, might know, in 2008, I edited um, this, this book called The Reality Street Book of Sonnets, uh, which I still rather vaingloriously um, consider an antidote to uh, most of the other big press um, anthologies, um, whose contents are, by and large, I think, the familiar names that, um, that have dogged our so-called um, national and international uh, education in poetry um, over the years. Um, and part of the problem lies, I think, with the sonnet form uh, itself, because it's such uh, a recognisable uh, form. Uh, in Viktor Shklovsky's terms, uh, it's all too familiar gestalt, and its historical pervasiveness have made it hard to see. It's become invisible, effectively, through overexposure. Perhaps going back to that, what you said about the original and, um, and Benjamin's aura. <coughs> Um, the form's very well-known history uh, makes it available to the point of solicitousness, by which I mean the sonnet kind of implores you to join in the tradition. Such qualities of openness and display have rendered it illegible. It's two familiar formal signifying devices, and we're all familiar with these, aren't we? The 14, 14 lines, first of all, the volta, uh, iambic pentameter in many cases, uh, it's divisions and subdivisions allowing for the development and retraction of an argument. It's fabled asymmetry in some instances. 
as well as its all too familiar content, have become so accepted that they make it impossible to move around in, as William Carlos Williams famously pointed out many, many years ago. The experience of reading sonnets in the big press anthologies is merely to witness how successive poets have oh so cleverly handled these devices in ways that have made them into little more than endlessly updatable commodities. Uh, Williams invented a category for this kind of handling of the form. Why not write sonnets, he asked in an essay called The Modern Primer in The Embodiment of Knowledge. Because, he carried on, unless the idea implied in the configuration can be deformed, it has not been used but copied. All sonnets mean the same thing, because it is the configuration of the words that is the major significance. Because it is a configuration whose meaning supersedes any idea that may be crammed into it. It is not an invention, but anchors beyond the will, does not liberate the intelligence, but stultifies it. And by its cleverness, apt use, stultifies it the more by making pleasurable that which should be removed. And that class of apt users is, I think, a very useful one. I'm going to use that instead of using the word mainstream, which I don't really, I'm slightly uncomfortable with and always have been. Definitions of that word apt, appropriate, suitable, becoming, apposite, shade off into calculated, habitually liable, inclined, prone. In other words, towards rather safe predictability. And I'm treating aptness here as synonymous with poetic, in inverted commas, or at least with an attitude towards a particular meaning of poetic, which would involve an unquestioning relation to tradition and a dehistoricized positioning in relation to certain historical developments within it. Williams's apt users are still, of course, legion. The internet has spawned uh, new generations of them, and if you look at all the sonnet websites available on the internet, uh, you'll see what I mean. Sonnet Central, 14 Magazine, 14 by 14, Measure, The Formalist, all of those uh, examples of, by and large, uh, decency and decorum. And nothing has really changed in many respects in the 70 or so years since Williams's objection. And I'm wondering actually whether anything's changed really since I brought this out um, uh, six or so years ago. Consider this quote from Evan Boland and Edward Hirsch's The Making of a Sonnet, which was published in the same year, actually in the same month as, uh, as my little anthology in 2008. This is what they say. A poem engages the sonnet tradition by making a case or taking up the subject matter of the traditional sonnet. It engages and echoes the tradition, sometimes by trying to refute it. One might say that it creates a sonnet experience. <laughs> that phrase, sonnet experience, I think is very telling. Promoting an engagement with the history of the form as heritage, an airbrushed history, emptied of conflict, closed to other traditions, and devoid of ambition. It's sonnet as museum. Press here for the rhyming couplet, Turn the handle for a Volta. I would want to make a case for the inept sonnet with qualities of ineptitude which are entirely without negative connotations. Its signifying features, clumsiness, ugliness, incompetence, naivety, awkwardness, anachronism, even outright failure would be entirely laudatory. Many of the sonnets, I think, I included in this little book, have something of those qualities. And if any of you are in the room, I apologise if that's not the case. <laughs> it doesn't apply to my <laughs> Richard, what am I saying? Um, I think writers of that kind of sonnet recognise in the sonnet form, and maybe this is something that, uh, that, um, that we can discuss, um, something of its ridiculousness. It's belatedness. Uh, there's no sense of responsibility, I think, to poetic form or to, to tradition, as there is in so much apt use sonnet writing. No deference to its historical significance, though significantly there is an acknowledgement of the form's uh, historical persistence. I think that's a very different um, thing. It's also partly the recognition that the sonnet is entirely artificial as a form, whereas apt users treat it as something altogether natural. 
Uh, another pitfall, I think, of working with all traditional forms, it's as if they kind of come out of nowhere and they become these natural, uh, natural forms. They're totally not. Or rather, apt users are caught in a quandary, whilst having to acknowledge devices like the couplet or the volta as artificial, they can't be made too artificial so as to be rendered uh, excessively visible. In Charles Bernstein's terms, they have to be absorbed and naturalised so as not to become too conspicuous. Otherwise, the form's artificiality becomes threateningly overwhelming. So, I prefer sonnets that waste the opportunities, if you like, offered by the form. And, of course, the sonnet has oh so many of these opportunities. Just to briefly mention, uh, before I finish, my own, uh, some of my own procedures. Uh, in 2010, I completed a sequence of sonnets called uh, India Sarts. And just a quick plug, there are a few of these back uh, at the back of the room. Um, which I wrote, I tried at least, to avoid paying too much conscious attention to any of the form's signifying features. I didn't decide not to use them, just not to make thinking about them any part of the writing process. However, because the sonnet is so overdetermined, some of these features insisted on their presence, making their way unconsciously into the work. And this often makes the poems, I think, uh, rather awkward to read. And that awkwardness uh, is important for me. I was recently talking to Alice Notley about this, who wrote one of the great uh, short sonnet sequences called 165 Meeting House Lane, many, many years at the beginning of the 70s, and she said, those poems, they read so awkwardly to me now, as if that was a kind of bad thing. I think that's what makes them great. Mm. Um, so that awkwardness um, is important for me. I use found material a lot in a lot of my writing, scouring other texts for phrases which de- uh, and recontextualize, make awkward sounding, and to my ear, compelling phrasal units. I often do this within specific discourse fields, which I read not so much for information as for text, uh, in this book, I required the terminology of medieval forest law. Uh, and a sart is a piece of land cleared from a forest. Uh, and in medieval times, a sarting was a practice carried out usually without the permission of the landowner and usually in incurring a considerable fine. Uh, and only recently did I really think m more carefully, not when I was writing it, the similarity between making a clearing and writing a sonnet. But rather than read, say, Oliver Rackham's A History of the Countryside to make me better informed about the countryside, I read it as a textual resource. Partially reading source text is not unlike the refusal to integrate my material into what Ron Silliman in the new sentence calls higher order signification. Phrases and whole poems constituting these phrases constantly gesture towards this higher order without attaining it. The attainment of that higher order is, of course, the aim of the apt sonnet, whose practitioners <coughs> insist on basking in its domain of signification and significance, meaning and meaningfulness, on being a part of what some critics have called the full story of the sonnet tradition. The inept sonnet, I would argue, admits that it could never enter this domain fully, just as the notion of a full story of the sonnet is an impossibility. The field is always imminent, a knowledge of it partial, metonymic, our involvement in it vulnerable to disappearance at any moment, awkward, belated, and really quite ridiculous. Sonnet, I adore you, it's my habit, said Bernadette Mayer, one of the great sonnet writers of the 20th century. And to end just with Ted Berrigan, I love you, and the sonnet is not dead. <laughs> Right, I think I'm going to change the subject. Oh, good. I feel as I'm in the wrong place. Excellent. Um, I'm going to read, actually... A, it's an alchemical I'm going to, You're going to transform us. I'm going to read um, from an article uh, I wrote about 20 years ago, I was surprised to find. This, this seems, it feels older than me, which can't be, can't be possible. Uh, 20 years ago, on, on alchemy, um, and it is heavily edited and annotated. Uh, I did that this morning. Okay. Oh, and I, I, alchemy, because of, yes, having been presented with the words tradition, 
and e experiment. Um, alchemy seemed to, as well as being a phenomenon that, that engages me enormously and, ha and relates to my writing very much, um, it seemed to s somehow embody both of those words, or to be both of those words very pertinent to alchemy, tradition and experiment. However, alchemical documents resist exegesis, remaining paradoxical and contradictory. Herein lies their allure. It's this resistance to a determinant reading, further confounded by the contrariety that alchemy was regarded as a science that is at the root of empathy. Alchemy is neither an exact science nor an art, but an enigmatic hybrid of both, occupying a space in which neither can justify a sole presence. Latter-day successors to the tradition are of diverse fields, notably psychoanalysis, modern chemistry and the arts. For the initiate, its fascination lies in its Sphinxian nature, a manifestation of obscure yet evocative languages. Alchemy appears to accommodate subjective and intuitive responses to received knowledge, a conjecture supported by an array of methods. Contemporary interest goes beyond an appreciation of the engrossing illustrations and diagrams, lying more enduringly in the identification of creative work with esoteric conversion. Specifically, the transformation of dull matter to a state of numinousness. A lack of documentary unanimity acknowledges an artistry weaving within the pseudo-scientific applications of the alchemical opus. An absence of consensus is not due to confusion or ignorance, but through a will to sustain a protean state sympathetic with the cosmological vision. This speculation is consistent with the importance of astrological observation in the alchemical work. Indeed, the word alconomy was coined to express this particular mystic syzygy. The cosmological perspective of the alchemist was subsequently usurped, dismissed as an ill-starred attempt to manufacture gold by the judgment of more empiricist and materialist thinkers. Ultimately, there remains an illustrated corpus that can be contemplated most fruitfully at a distance from seductive myths of gold making. The alchemists practice of annotating and glossing the texts they studied deposited a residue of past readings, the reader's gaze retained within the page fibers. The historical trajectory of the art exists as an archaeological site of the reading experience, a body of works constituting a dense plexus of anonymous additions, modifications, Commentaries on the original texts were added in a way which rendered them difficult to distinguish from the original. Such uncertainty concerning authorship and origins touches reflections on the author's role within the ferment of writing. The writer is envisaged as factotum within a field of energies embodying her medium, reciting the creator in a capacity closer to that of mediumship an artificer. Doubt about the identities of alchemical writers promotes the primacy of process over the creative functionary acting as an agent for the dutiful conversion of a passively accepted cultural legacy. Writers from Homer to Shakespeare have had knowledge of the subject and, significantly, its enigmatic spirit which remains indifferent to the law of authorship, infuses the Western literary canon. It's unlikely, and more importantly, is not of principal concern, that alchemy could actually yield gold from baser matter. 
commitment to such a seemingly flawed project is, however, compelling. And the suspicion that material failure was inherent in the procedure needs to be contemplated. Alchemy is, in a sense, defective. The history of an error. Though perhaps this is the point. It's the, it is experience of the process that is of importance, is transformative, not any objective. The suggestion of a formulated fallibility finds affinity with a contemporary focus on the deconstruction of goal-oriented operations, the accommodation of multiple readings, the marginal gaining ascendancy over a centripetal meaning, the mutable word salad over the prosaic, the street over the museum. Envisioned is an unending transition reaching no fixed terminus, for the course is cyclic, a projection of a goalless goal. It may be surmised that the alchemist's true aspiration was ineffable and ultimately resisted in coding and communication. This bedeviled in the present by amplification of the erroneous project of gold manufacture. The supposed target is actually subordinate to the art's passage and its wake. The procedural indeterminacy of alchemical texts aligns with this speculation. They remain elusive. A record of diverse modi operandi exists rather than a definitive approach, and the intrinsic nature of what the stages were intended to achieve can only be a retrospective surmise. It becomes apparent that the term gold is generally, perhaps exclusively, used in a figurative sense. Plausibly, the labours were not solely material endeavours, but were precipitators of, and acted reciprocally with, psychical metamorphoses. The alchemist worked upon and with the psyche, a work embodied in and energised by the transmutation of substance in a manner akin to sympathetic magic by which the magus projects interior energies onto external concrete phenomena, which are then ritually transfigured so as to engender within the adept an analogous conversion. Alchemy was a spiritual discipline allegorized in the transmutation of base matter to gold. Thus, the alchemist becomes a journeyman of the soul.